We've come in our study to number six, verse five. And um, when we see verses five and six, we encounter a phenomenon in scripture which occurs over and over. There's a technical name for it in English. It's taken from two Greek words and the word is anthropomorphism. Here's what it means. It means that Scripture sometimes talks about God as if He were a man. It's from the Greek word anthropos, which means man, and um, the word morphe, which means kind, or another word, or the verb which means to, to change or to transform. We only have human language. We don't have the language of deity. We can't relate to deity. Well, here are the verses. Genesis 6, 5, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now that's a very comprehensive summary. Every and all and continually. The Lord was sorry that He had made man on the earth, and He was grieved in His heart. Now that is a classic anthropomorphism. Is Scripture saying that the Lord says, Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I wish I hadn't made man. That's what it would mean in a man. But God is not a man. Does it mean that the situation surprised God? Does it mean that He didn't know it was going to happen? Does it mean that uh, He wasn't prepared for this? No, it doesn't mean any of those things. If those things were true, God wouldn't be God. He would be finite, not infinite. God is omniscient. God knows everything. God knows the future. God knows things before they take place. God not only knows the future, God controls the future. But the biblical writer is describing a situation as it, as it would have taken place in the heart of a man. He's describing that corresponding reality in God. God has a sorrow, the potential for sorrow, that approaches our idea of regret, but it's not because he was surprised. But there was a sorrow and a disappointment in God which moved him to judgment. And God determines that he will undo the creation, both human and animal creation, and that he will bring a judgment on, of death. Now, he brings a judgment of death on every, hum, on every living creature in every generation. But this is going to be a sudden judgment and a terrible judgment. There will be an exception to judgment and there will be an exercise of grace. Verse 8 says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah, this man who's the father of three sons. Now in Genesis 6, 14, a command is given to Noah, this man who finds favor. Make for yourself an ark. And then he tells him how to build the ark. It says in verse 22 that Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. Now, notice the contrast. Chapter 6, verse 5 says that everybody was wicked and every intent of the thoughts of their heart were only wicked continually. That's 6.5. 6, 6.22 says, then Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. All the men on the earth did everything bad. One man on the earth obeyed God in every command. And apparently, when we look at verse two, 3, which says, His days shall be 120 years, apparently, from the time Noah was told to build the ark until the day 
that Noah entered the ark was 120 years. There was a terrible, terrible man who wrote terrible things about God. He was a brilliant man. He was a classical scholar. He was a philosopher. He was a writer. And he was the son of a Lutheran pastor. His name was Nietzsche. In his terrible, terrible writings, there's one beautiful phrase. And it's a phrase that was adopted by the Christian writer Eugene Peterson and made the title of a Christian book on the Psalms, the Psalms of Ascent, the Psalms that the pilgrims sang as they went on pilgrimage and they journeyed up, winding up the Judean hills to Jerusalem on the feast days. These were the songs of ascent that the pilgrims sang. Well, Eugene Peterson wrote a book on the Psalms of Ascent, and he named it something very beautiful. But the beautiful phrase was actually invented by an unbeliever. And not only an unbeliever, but by a savage hater of Christianity, uh, Fre Frederick Nietzsche. And the, the book is named A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Why did Eugene Peterson choose that for his study? Well, it took a long time to get to Jerusalem. And when they, went to, they had to walk to Jerusalem. And when they would walk to Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts, they would repeat psalms. They would sing psalms called the Psalms of Ascent, the Psalms of Going Up as they went up in the hills to Jerusalem. And so Peterson called that a long obedience in the same direction. This man was told to build an ark. It took him 120 years. That's a long obedience in the same direction. Now, um, we're not sure, we're not sure that it rained before the flood, at least like it rains today. The ground was uh, watered by springs and by mists. It's possible that the people who watched Noah build the ark were being warned against something they'd never seen or never experienced. And even if they had seen rain, maybe they'd never seen a flood. You can bet that because he was building something so big, so unusual, and so unique, that Noah very rapidly became the most famous person in the world. And the reason that he gave for building the ark must have become famous too. In other words, the people in the world would have known of the warning of judgment. They would know, have known that the ark was an ark of salvation. But and and we're in, in the New Testament, Noah is called a preacher of righteousness. So evidently, not only did Noah build the boat for 120 years, but Noah preached warning and judgment and appeal for 120 years. But no one responded. No one uh, outside his own family. In verse in, in chapter 7, verse 1, God says. It's time to go in. The Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and your household, for you alone have I seen to be righteous before me uh, in this time and, and in this generation. Now, a couple of things about the construction of the ark. We're not going to spend very much time on this because we don't have very much time. But in verse 14, chapter 6, verse 14, God says, Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. Perhaps it's cypress, perhaps it's cedar. We can't be sure exactly what gopher wood was in that generation. You shall make the ark with rooms. Now this is what I want you to notice. And you shall cover it inside and out with pitch, a kind of tar. This is to keep the water out. This is to seal the wood and make it secure, to make it waterproof. The word used for pitch in Genesis 6, 14 
is the word kapoor. It's the word covering. It's the word for atonement. So those who enter the ark are going to be covered. The waters of judgment are going to be kept out. There was an old Puritan preacher who preached a sermon titled um, The Ark, no, uh, called Jesus Christ, an ark for all of God's Noah's. The ark is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. All who are in Christ will be sheltered from the wrath of God, shall be sheltered from judgment, shall be sheltered from death. Those who are outside of Christ have no shelter from the wrath of God, have no shelter from death. Now, let me say that we can't be exactly sure that the measurements in an age before the flood were exactly the same as our measurements today. But um, think, of a rail, think of a railroad car. As we see the size of the ark in verse 14, the length is 300 cubits, the breadth is 50 cubits, and the height is 30 cubits. Um, this would equal 522 railroad cars. This would give room uh, in only 188 um, cars for um, well, it would give room for about 14,000 tons. Only 188 cars would hold 400, w w excuse me, would hold 45,000 animals the size of sheep. Probably there were 17,000 species of animals now, of living things. Now let's stop a minute. What about the fish? Well, the fish aren't really included. It says those who have breath, those who are on the earth who have breath. Scientists tell us that if you had rain like this, it would kill the fish anyway. Let me say that this is a supernatural spiritual judgment worked out through physical media. But it's supernatural. It's not normal. First of all, you've got to get the animals on the boat. You can't get them on the boat normally. Secondly, the animals have to be in a state of calmness, being anesthetized, being calmed down. You can't do that normally. The whole thing is supernatural. The judgment is supernatural. Getting the animals on the boat is supernatural. Taking care of the animals on the boat is a supernatural thing. You know, God called the man that he saved to a very unpleasant thing. I want you to work like crazy for 120 years. You won't know why till the 120 years are over. Then I want you to stay several weeks in a boat that's not going to smell good. It's going to be full of animals. And you're to take care of those animals and to preserve the life of those animals as long as you're on the boat. First, I want you to be a builder, and then I want you to be a farmer. But you're going to be a farmer inside, not outside. But you're going to preserve the whole world. You're going to preserve the life of everyone who is still alive. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TBS Ministry. For more information, please visit tbsseminary.com. Now, the um, going on to the, the ark, and the beginning of the flood is described in chapter 7. Verse 11 of chapter 7 says, In the 600th year of, of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open. It wasn't only rain. Something broke up underneath. The water was not only falling, the water was rising. And it wasn't the normal rain from clouds only that we think of today. The canopy over the earth was dissolved 
and the water came down on the earth. Now, um, when we were talking about Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, we asked this question, how old is the universe? Is it possible to say that the universe really is uh, 12 to 14 billion years old? To say that life is 4.5 billion years old? To say that human life is 1 billion years old? Is it possible to believe that and to be faithful to the biblical record? We talked about that possibility. We talked about um, can you really stretch the, what, the, what the Bible says to allow for those kinds of numbers? Yeah, it's possible. It's possible through the gap theory between chapter 1 verse 1 and chapter 1 verse 2. It's possible by asking yourself the question, how long were Adam and Eve alive before they sinned? It's possible by um, taking the Hebrew word for day in chapter 2, the word yom, and arguing that that doesn't have to be 24 hours every time it's used. All those things are possible. I don't believe it. I believe the earth is comparatively young, but it is possible. Now we have a similar question here. And the question is, was this flood universal or was it local? Let me just say that just as there are many very fine Christians and very scholarly Christians who believe that the universe is very, 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 very old and who believe that human life is very, 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 very old, there are also many very fine and scholarly Christians who argue that the flood was local. And they can play with the Hebrew and they can suggest possible alternative explanations and they can make a fairly good argument that the flood was local. But I want to say something else. I, I have to believe that the reason Christians work so hard in Genesis 1 and 2 to make the universe old. And the reason that Christians work so hard in Genesis 7 and 8 to make the flood local doesn't have anything to do with what the Bible says. It has to do with scientific cal calculations. And it has to do with evidence and testimony outside the Bible, not evidence and testimony inside the Bible. So I say again for the fifth or sixth time, I'm not a scientist. I'm a Bible student. So you need to examine the arguments of people who are scientists who do believe the biblical record. Their opinion is more important than mine. But I'll just say this. I won't defend it. I'll just say it. I believe that the flood was universal. It means nothing to me to try to prove that the flood could not have been universal. Maybe it could not have been universal if it were only a natural phenomenon. But it wasn't a natural phenomenon. It was a supernatural phenomenon. The God who created the world and the God who invented natural law is now overruling the creation of the world and overruling natural law to bring judgment. And that's what is happening during the flood.